All right, everybody. Three, two, one. I'm going to hope my clap sync works here. It's very difficult. You know, one of the great things that Brandon does is he takes my normally very loud voice and he runs it through a variety of different filters, which help my, my tones to come across as smoother and more dulcet. I'm not able to do that, so I kind of have to record these solo as if I'm whispering. Um, it's like I'm afraid of someone finding out I'm doing this. This is uh, my version of recording in Anne Frank's attic. And in the spirit of that, I'm now going to talk about masturbating for the next 45 minutes. Okay, let, uh, let me pull this up. I'm very paranoid. I've been trying to get the mic to work. And there's been a lot of uh, static going on. But I think we've got it. And with that said, I'm Perry. This is Hidden Plain Sight. And no one else is here. Uh, Brandon is a, a frontline worker. He's part of the, the thin comedic line that protects our country from the humorless. So I believe he's out with uh, Alex somewhere, you know, probably harassing someone at a <laughs> city council meeting. So it's just me today, but that's okay, because this is going to be a bit of a different episode. Uh, as you probably know by this point, Mr. Corey Good has run into a spot of trouble with uh, his lawsuits, uh, that spot of trouble being mainly that none of them worked, which, um, not a terribly shocking development, and in fact, I think it's kind of been expected, but it's nice to see it finally happen. So I figured, uh, sort of in the spirit of our last live stream, where we read through all of the P. Diddy document, I figured I'll read through all of this document. It's only, you know, it's 36 pages, which is about half the length of that Diddy document. Um, so, how am I going to go about doing this? I am a bit paranoid, too, about because I'm using my phone to record the video, and I'm not sure I have enough space. But worst case scenario, you will get the audio of this. With that in mind, in the United States District Court for the District of Colorado, Judge Daniel D. Domenico... And this is the lawsuit of James Corey Good, Good Enterprise Solutions. You know, it's ironic to name your company Good Enterprise Solutions when they have done nothing but provide problems. There hasn't, there hasn't been a, a solution dealt out by them in many a moon. And then the plaintiffs, I kind of don't want to read the plaintiffs' names because they're going to appear a bunch during the course of this document, I would imagine. Order on motions to dismiss. In their operative second amended complaint, plaintiffs and counter defendants, James Corey Good and Good Enterprise Solutions, Inc. allege various claims against several defendants. This order addresses the motions to dismiss filed by defendants Gaia Inc., uh, Jerka Raisavi, Brad Warkins, and Kirsten Medvedich. I'm sorry for butchering all those names. And uh, Jay Widener. So, uh, in the future, the, the document is probably going to repeat all those names quite a few times. I'm not going to read them each time because it's a pain in the ass. So I will just say the defendants, and that is who, am I, uh, who I am talking about, unless I specifically indicate otherwise. Let's proceed to the background portion of this document. The following facts are taken from the plaintiff's operative second amended complaint, Doc 111, and must be presumed true for purposes of the motions at issue to the extent that they are non-conclusory and do not state legal conclusions. Mr. Good is an educational and motivational speaker. What the fuck is he educating us on? I guess how not to win a lawsuit at this point. He, uh, I liked the move the other day on Twitter, is he just tried to post something, after all this came out, he tried to post something that had nothing to do with the fact that, you know, five of his lawsuits just got shot back. He's, he was a much happier person when he was doing the, the reaping, but the sewing he doesn't seem to be so good at. The only thing he should have sewed was his mouth shut, because that would have saved him a lot of heartache over the last several, several, uh, years, but... Uh, when when you're doing the reaping and you're the wealthy one in the situation, it feels pretty good because you are uh, vengeful and you're you're striking out against those you perceive to be wronging you. But the problem with uh, reaping in an unethical fashion is eventually you will have to sow. And now we're seeing the, the seeds sprout and he is not handling it well, which is good news for us because that means good content. 
There's nothing more entertaining than an angry, stupid person. All right, I'm sorry. I'm only a sentence in. Mr. Good is an educational and motivational speaker. If you're being motivated by him, I, I don't know what to tell you. Influencer, author. Come on, you can't call that comic book an author. And media figure, and is well-known and respected. Man, they can't get two words in without saying something false. I guess well-known and media figure are accurate, but in terms of uh, respected in the conscious community... I, I do not believe that to be the case anymore because it's, uh, you know, many people have pointed this out over the course of the years, but the, the conscious community is uh, pretty big on light and love and not so big on um, lawsuits and attempting to create division, which is pretty much, he has spent more time in his career at this point attempting to ruin lives than he did attempting to improve them. So I don't know how he uh, squares that away with how he perceives himself. Well, actually, I do. He's delusional, in my opinion. You know, the nice part about him losing all these lawsuits, too, is normally I have to caveat all my language because he's a very litigious man. But it's hard to be litigious when you're fucking broke. So, you know, maybe I can be a bit meaner. I guess we'll see how I uh, feel as we get through this. Good Enterprise Solutions is a company owned by Mr. Good and his wife, which produces educational, spiritual, health, and entertainment goods and services geared towards the conscious community. Good Enterprise Solutions holds all rights and title to the intellectual property that Mr. Good has developed. Mr. Good is part of the disclosure movement, and he publicly shares his personal experiences involving a... <laughs> I can't believe this is in a court document... I guess, you know, this is the background section, so they have to give the full background from his perspective. He can't just, uh, this, this section should be one sentence, and it should just say, Corey Good is full of shit. But you can't do that if you're a judge, I guess. He is part of this disclosure movement, and he publicly shares his personal experiences involving a secret space program called 20 and Back. Well, that's not really true either. 20 and Back is a different, it's not part of the program, it's, it's a different thing. Uh, so he's part of this 20 and back into angelic beings he calls the Blue Avians. He had developed branding regarding the Sphere Being Alliance. Mr. Good's public dissemination of his stories attracted the attention of Defending Gaia, a movie and television network. In June 2015, Gaia, through Mr. Widener and the Gaia individuals, approached Mr. Good and his friend David Wilcock, hey, David got to mention, with a proposal to star on a show called Cosmic Disclosure. And the world would never be the same. The two agreed, and the show was successful. Uh, yes, somehow, yes. I, I still remember the very moment I was first exposed to this nonsense. It was back in uh, Brandon and my weed company days, where uh, the vast majority of our, our day was spent rolling joints in, in our joint rolling factory. And that left us with a ton of time to listen to audiobooks. And that's how Brandon got looped into all this nonsense at first. Uh, and that's through him, I was made aware of all this stuff. But I remember Brandon paid for Guy at one point, and when the first episode of Cosmic Disclosure came out, I was walking down the stairs in our apartment, and he just pulled me over. He's like, you guys see, this is the craziest fucking thing I've ever seen. And, in fact, it was so crazy, it kind of shattered the illusion for him. It was too nuts to hear a guy talk about blue chickens and continue to buy into it. Where was I... Uh, during the three years that Mr. Good worked on Cosmic Disclosure, he generated content about his personal story that had been sharing and developing prior to his involvement with Gaia, including content regarding the Blue Avians 20 and back and Sphere being Alliance. Uh, that's a brutal sentence. It's not clear which is in the role of P.T. Barnum here, <laughs> but it's apparent there is a lucrative market for all this. That's a very kind way of saying the judge recognizes this is fucking ludicrous, but there's idiots out there who believe anything. Although, uh, Corey, the P.T. Barnum at least, you know, got shit done. Corey hasn't really done much uh, on his own. He, he was only successful. He's kind of uh, the, the Pete Best of cosmic disclosure. He got left out when everyone started going off and doing their own thing. Mr. Good and Gaia entered into a series of contracts promising various forms of compensation in exchange for Mr. Good's work on cosmic disclosure. Mr. Good negotiated these contracts through the defendants, 
Uh, Mr. Good alleges that Gaia, through Mr. Raisavi, breached those contracts by failing to pay him compensation owed, including a performance bonus, uh, license royalties, and stock options due to harassment from Mr. Widener, who was eventually fired after Mr. Good reported his abusive behavior. I'm not sure if that's an accurate reflection of reality. I tend to just not believe anything that comes from Corey's side because, um, you know, he has a prolific history of being a liar. Uh, I think it would actually be much more shocking if he said anything true. Due to harassment, right, uh, Jay got fired. Um, and not, uh, and this is Corey again, not being paid the compensation he was promised. Mr. Good left Gaia after fulfilling his contract requirements, but not before David Wilcock decided to call them all satanic pedophiles, and then he had to issue a public retraction. That's a pretty sick move, though. Look, I, I love guys who tell their boss to shove it, and what better way to do that than accuse them of raping children and worshiping the devil? It's funny how much they throw, they throw all these absolutely batshit insane allegations around. Um, it's, it's relatively serious. One of the worst crimes you can commit is raping a child. Um, that's, that's pretty bad. That's, even the guys in prison aren't a fan of people who do that. So for them to uh, willy-nilly declare people to have done that and then get incredibly offended when someone points out that they're fucking idiots doesn't really make sense. Being an idiot isn't nearly as bad as being a child rapist. But what do I know? Mr. Good filed federal trademark applications for Blue Avians, 20 and Dax, Sphere Being Alliance, and SBA. Trademarks were issued for Sphere Being Alliance and SBA, but Gaia ins uh, instituted opposition proceedings regarding Blue Avians and 20 and Back. Gaia and the Gaia individuals have continued to use 20 and Back in advertising and promotional materials after Mr. Good filed his trademark application, trademark, and uh, sent them <laughs> cease and desist letters. Gaia hired other people to take over Mr. Good's role on Cosmic Disclosure, who have continued to use Mr. Good's trademarks on the show. Gaia and Mr. Widener also use Mr. Good's trademarks in their social media posts and have defamed and harassed Mr. Good on social media. Well, even if something is trademarked, you are, you're allowed to mention it. I'm allowed to mention the name Coca-Cola when I'm talking. Just someone mentioning your trademark doesn't mean anything. If they're meaningfully profiting off of it, I, I guess that would be an issue. I suppose I should take this time to point out I know nothing about the law. I just know about making fun of idiots, so that's what I'm here to do. I spilled on my shirt doing that. How embarrassing. Uh, Mr. Good, where was I? I'm sorry. Blue Avis 20 back. Gaia and the Gaia individuals have continued to use it, right? Um, Mr. Good, Gaia and Mr. Widener also use Mr. Good's trademarks in their social media posts and uh, defamed and harassed him on social media. Plaintiffs also allege that Mr. Widener has threatened and stalked. That's a, <laughs> what a combo. He has threatened and stalked Mr. Good and divulged Mr. Good's private information on social media. Ooh. He has also threatened... Well, I... Uh, at a certain point, if you're going to make threats, you got to... The bad part about threats is people typically take it to mean you have some sort of intent on following through with such a threat. If there's no intent to follow through, it's kind of just words. And I don't... Uh, you know, I don't really see anyone in this cosmic disclosure community being the, the type of person who's willing to uh, kick in a door and pistol whip a man over at the 20 and back. But I think Corey just likes to create these grand cosmic operas in which he is the persecuted individual because that, that makes it easier to accept his level of failure. Because if you're a failure all because of uh, your own doing, that's one thing. But if evil entities are afoot in society intent on keeping you down. I guess it kind of um, eases the feeling of failure because now you can externalize the uh, realities that have put you in a bad position. So he divulged his information. He has also threatened Mr. Good via email and through videos, live streams, and other media produced both by him and by others at his direction. I want some of these videos. Where are the threat videos? Some of these threats have been violent and caused Mr. Good to fear for his life and the life of his family. That's because Mr. Good is a pussy. I don't... 
another issue, you know, not to keep pointing it out, but I am going to continue pointing it out. He does claim to be a super soldier, right? That's the, you know, part of being a soldier, I've never, never served, but to the, the best of my understanding, soldiers typically do fighting. And if I were to have been selected by the United States government due to my prolific ability to fight and implement some form of psychic attack, I would not be super worried about a guy threatening me because I could use my, my psychic abilities and whatever form of martial arts has been taught to me by the Golden Triangle beings, I could use that to uh, fight back. And they allege that Gaia, with the influence of the Gaia individuals, and Mr. Widener has blacklisted Mr. Good from multiple ufology and conscious community conferences and radio shows. And Mr. Good is no longer invited to attend as a speaker at those events. How hilarious. Mr. Good says that he has suffered financial losses through the breach of contract with Gaia. He suffered damages from the harassment and loss of reputation. Well, he deserved the loss of reputation. He shouldn't have had a reputation to begin with. Losses by the abuse of his trademark and monetary losses by the consternation in the community that followed his loss of goodwill. Mr. Good brings 13 claims at issue in this order. Number one, RICO violations. Uh, number two, RICO conspiracy under and against Mr. Widener. Number three, federal trademark infringement. Number, oh, that's against Gaia, Mr. Widener. Number four, false, uh, federal false designation of origin and unfair competition against Gaia and Mr. Widener. Number five, common law trademark and trade name infringement against Gaia and Mr. Widener. Common law unfair competition against Gaia, Gaia individuals, Mr. Widener. Number seven, Colorado Consumer Protection Act violations against Gaia, the Gaia individuals, Mr. Widener. Number eight, breach of contract. Um, number nine, fraudulent misrepresentation. Ten, slander per se. Ooh, Number 11, libel per se. Number 12, tortuous inference with a business expectancy. And number 13, declaratory judgment of trademark validity against Gaia. Oh, fuck. I'm on page four. Yeah, there's no way my, I'm going to give video all this. My phone's going to fill up at some point. All right, this will probably be audio only. We'll see. Legal standard. When presented with a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim under federal rule of civil procedure, a district court must decide whether the facts alleged in the complaint, if true, would entitle the claimant to some legal remedy. The court must accept the alleged facts as true and view them in light uh, in the light most favorable to the claimant. But the court need not accept as true conclusi uh, conclusory allegations that are unsupported by factual uh, affirmance. I don't know that word. I'm an idiot. At least I admit it. The claimant's factual allegations must be enough to raise a right to relief above the speculative level, uh, mere labels and conclusions, and a formulaic recitation of the elements of cause of action will not suffice. A court will disregard conclusory statements and look only to whether the remaining factual allegations plausibly suggest the defendant is liable. To survive a motion to dismiss, a complaint must contain sufficient factual allegations that, accepted as true, allow the court to draw a reasonable inference that the defendants are liable for the misconduct alleged. I'm also, I'm not going to, you know, cite the case law. All those were, were littered with the different cases. Discussion. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm psyched. We're starting claim one, the RICO, RICO violations. Gord Good, he thought it was like, uh, he thought he was fighting Young Thug and YSL. It was a J, J. Widener is King Slime in this case. Uh, the <laughs> The plaintiffs assert that guy individuals violated the RICO statute. To state a private RICO claim, a plaintiff must allege four elements. One, conduct. Two, of an enterprise. Three, through a pattern of four, racketeering activity. Well, just reading that, I mean, it seems pretty obvious none of that was happening. The idea that Jay and people who worked at Gaia were organizing some sort of criminal enterprise specifically for the purposes of harassing Corey is ridiculous, but when you're a, uh, in my opinion, insane narcissist, of course any sort of action taken against you must be contrived, because people wouldn't just hate you, they have to team up together to hate you, because he's otherwise uh, so, so likable. 
where the term enterprise is statutorily defined and includes any individual partnership, corporation, association, or other legal entity in any union or group of individuals associated, in fact, although not a legal entity. A pattern requires at least two predicate acts of racketeering activity, which is defined by statute to include violations of certain other laws. The predicate acts that the plaintiffs allege here are wire fraud and mail fraud. Isn't that interesting? The predicate act of wire fraud makes it unlawful to devise any scheme or artifice to defraud or for obtaining money or property by means of false or fraudulent pretenses, representations, or promises, and transmit or cause to be transmitted by means of wire, radio, or television communication in interstate or foreign commerce, any writing, signs, signals, pictures, or sounds for the purpose of executing such a scheme or artifice. It really makes all the people who were uh, against him sound so cool. They, they were all involved, and in it was basically a mob. So says Corey. You know, that didn't exactly play out, which I'm sure we'll get to in about 30 pages. The predicate act of mail fraud requires a scheme or artifice to defraud or for obtaining money or property by means of false fraudulent pretenses and in support of this scheme or artifice, the placement of any matter in the mail for delivery by the Postal Service. Well, that checks out. you you got to use the Postal Service to commit mail fraud. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure requires particularity in pleading RICO mail and wire fraud. The Gaia individuals argue that the plaintiffs have not adequately pleaded any valid instances of wire or mail fraud. Well, who says the instant needs to be valid, let alone two or more instances of such? Damn, so Corey didn't even get one. The plaintiffs allege that in furtherance of their scheme to defraud and with the purpose of executing their schemes to defraud, the guy individuals herein caused the use of mails and interstate wires for the purpose of defrauding plaintiffs of millions of dollars. Millions of dollars were, were lost. Uh, Medovich on March 27th, 2018 at 5.53 p.m., Knowing that Gaia had no intent of fulfilling its financial obligations to Mr. Good, Medovich sent an email to him demanding he appear for filming episodes of Cosmic Disclosure. Mr. Good declined, stating that it is a few days' notice. Oh, stating that a few days' notice was not sufficient. Well, your only job was filming Cosmic Disclosure, right? If they gave you a few days' of notice to show up. That seems pretty reasonable to me. I guess maybe I've just worked different jobs. But if on Monday my boss told me I needed to appear on Friday, I feel like I could manage to swing that. The same day at 11.07 p.m., she informed him that Gaia would be moving forward with shooting scenes for Cosmic Disclosure with or without him, knowing Gaia was intending to use Good's branding, marks, and message his... <laughs> I don't know if this is a typical thing, but there's now, in parentheses, it says his, and then in quotes, his IP. I'm hoping that's a judge taking a shot at him for his god-awful deposition footage. Uh, they say this was through another guest that was not authorized by Good to use Good's protected IP. Well, the problem with this, though, is usually when you work for a company without, you know, unless you clarify, they kind of own the IP you create on their time. Uh, I obviously don't have access to their contracts, but that is the way I've typically heard of it being handled. Warkins on, I don't know who that is, on February 25th, 2016, at 7.02 p.m., Warkins sent an email to his colleague at Gaia, Kevin Spracht, asking for information on a payment that had been sent to Good. Good stated he did not believe that it was in the right amount. <laughs> Corey, Corey, he never knows what the correct amount is. He always just knows the correct amount is more than what he was paid, which kind of a cool move if it ever actually works you just keep demanding more money but uh, that only happens when the good times are rolling and when everyone kind of starts fighting back against you you can't just continuously demand more money for no reason on february 26 2018 at 12 38 p.m workins replied to good that he had spoken with rice savi and that the amount was correct both workins and rice savi knew it was an underpayment neither remedied the payment I guess we'll see if that ended up being true later. Raisavi on February 26, 2018. Uh, Raisavi and Workins exchanged emails related to an underpayment to Good that they knew was an underpayment. Raisavi was to get back to Good personally. Over a week later on March 5, 2018 at 10.36 p.m., 
Rysavi finally responded to Good and explained how the pay structure was to work, knowing that it was not what Good and Gaia slash Rysavi himself had agreed to. While negotiating his talent contract, Mr. Good met with the Gaia defendants. Mr. Good was promised various forms of compensation in exchange for his appearance on Cosmic Disclosure, including inter alia $150,000 in stock options, a percentage of the revenue brought in by Cosmic Disclosure through talent fees and fees under the Ambassador Program. Mr. Good agreed to work with Gaia in exchange for these promises, in addition to a monetary amount agreed to the parties. Gaia, through Raisavi, Workins, and Medovich, never reduced these uh, never reduced these agreements to writing. Although Mr. Good requested they be memorialized in a written contract. Well, but if they were never put in a contract, you can't really demand they be fulfilled unless there's some sort of evidence that these actually existed. Also, 150 k in stock options for just being a liar seems like a really good gig, right? Like, you're not, you're just lying. I would gladly accept 150 k just to lie. Mr. Good requested they be uh, put in writing, right? All three defendants through interstate emails and phone calls. Is that what they're alleging by wire fraud? Is emails interstate? That... Seems like a really low bar for a RICO charge. Uh, interstate emails and phone calls assured Mr. Good that Gaia would keep its word. All three defendants to date have reneged on all of these agreements. <laughs> Good. The Gaia defendants know that the Good marks belong to and were claimed by Good. They intentionally caused, through interstate emails and phone calls, the Good marks to be used in interstate commerce through its broadcasts without Good's approval. Let me get a drink of water here. There's a lot of reading. The common thread between wire fraud and mail fraud is the concept of fraud. Wow. <laughs> I never would have put that together. That's good insight. Which, to be actionable, requires one, a representation, two, that is false, three, that is material, and four, the speaker's knowledge of its falsity or ignorances of its truth. Five, the speaker's intent is to be acted on. Six, the hearer's ignorance of the falsity of the representation. Seven, the hearer's reliance. Eight, the hearer's right to rely on it. And number nine, injury. As to Ms. Medovich's, the plaintiffs allege no false statement or misrepresentation by her in the above-cited email communications. As to Mr. Warkins and Mr. Raisavi, while the plaintiff alleges that those defendants stated that payment amounts were correct while well knowing they were underpayments, the plaintiffs failed to allege that Mr. Good was ignorant of the truth uh, of those statements or that he relied on statements to his detriment. The plaintiff's broader allegations that Mr. Good relied on various promises made by the Gaia individuals when he agreed to work with Gaia does not meet the particularity standard of Rule 9b which requires a plaintiff to set forth the time, place, and contents of the false representation, the identity of the party making the false statements, and the consequences thereof. The plaintiffs have failed to allege any, po <laughs> any plausible fraudulent scheme that includes the above-cited emails or any specific fraudulent misrepresentation. Well, just because they failed on every single count that is required... Does that really mean Corey was in the wrong? Could it possibly be that Corey and his legal team were so immensely incompetent that they couldn't even hit on one of the required elements? Certainly seems that way, doesn't it? Because the plaintiff's allegations are insufficient to establish the elements of mail or wire fraud as the predicate acts, I need not address the remaining elements of the RICO case. Ouch, that hurts. It's so shitty to begin with, he doesn't even have to examine the whole, the whole thing. The plaintiff's RICO claim against the Gaia individuals must be be dismissed. I wish I had a gavel or something here. So that's that's claim one. Thrown out the window. We're on to claim two. Rico conspiracy. Rico Suave conspiracy. Corey Corey was going to steal his music and become a pop star. This appears to be against uh, Mr. Widener. The plaintiffs assert a conspiracy-based RICO violation against Mr. Widener and three other defendants against whom the plaintiffs' claims have already been dismissed. <laughs> the plaintiff, That is kind of the issue with this, is, you know, a lot of the, the charges were kind of based upon each other, and once the big one gets thrown out, it's probably going to be much more difficult to prove the smaller ones. The plaintiffs allege that these defendants conspired to obtain Mr. Good's interests in business and or property. 
The plaintiffs assert that Mr. Widener violated uh, this act by conspiring to violate 18 U.S.C. Doc 111. These two statutory subparts provide... It shall be unlawful for any person employed or associated with any enterprise engaged in or the activities of which affect interstate or foreign commerce to conduct or participate directly or indirectly in the conduct of such enterprises' affairs through a pattern of racketeering activity or collection of unlawful debt. It shall be unlawful for any person to conspire to violate any of the provisions of this subsection or of this section. As with the plaintiff's RICO claim against guy individuals discussed above, the racketeering activity, which is also put in quotes that I like, uh, alleged in the RICO conspiracy claim against Mr. Widener is mail fraud and wire fraud. Pursuant to the statute, conspiracy to commit a RICO violation constitutes a violation of the act when a conspirator adopts the goal of furthering the enterprise, even if the conspirator does not commit a predicate act. In other words, if a defendant agrees to further the enterprise of other defendants who are alleged to have violated the section, then he may have violated the section. A claim of conspiracy requires plaintiff to demonstrate direct or circumstantial evidence of a meeting of the minds, or, well, you're not going to find any minds in this community. Even if they had done it, they wouldn't have been there. No, I'm sorry, that's not fair. I like Jay. <laughs> I just sometimes the people in this community... Uh, I guess maybe maybe it's not the case anymore. I, I certainly think to have been roped in by this initially, you had to have been pretty gullible. But I get it. It was a fun story. It would have been, it would have been imagined. Imagine if it had been true. But it wasn't. Conspiracy can be shown by a sequence of events from which a reasonable jury could infer there was a meeting of the minds, but conclusory allegations that defendants acted in concert or conspired without specific factual allegations to support such assertions are insufficient. Mr. Widener argues that the plaintiff's alleged RICO conspiracy claim is entirely conclusory and fails to allege how he somehow conspired with the guy individuals or other named defendants to violate the section. I agree. Well, that was quick, wasn't it? <laughs> As discussed above, the plaintiffs have failed to sufficiently plead their substitute of uh, RICO claim under Section 1962C against the guy individuals. Even if they had sufficiently pleaded a substantive violation, the plaintiffs have provided no allegations to support a finding that Mr. Widener had a meeting of the minds with any of the guy individuals. Well, just because they provided no evidence... Well, I guess that's a big issue, isn't it? <laughs> Just because they provided no evidence doesn't mean there's not evidence, but you do have to show up with something other than an allegation. And their assertion that a conspiracy consists of Mr. Widener conspiring with the defendants. Oh, familiar names here. Cliff High, Alyssa Montebalo, and uh, Monte Montalbano. I don't, I, how do I, I've been talking about these guys for four years and I still don't know any of their names. And then Benjamin Zvodnik. I think that's CW, I'm not entirely sure. Working together to deprive Mr. Good of pecuniary gain by disseminating defamatory videos. <laughs> this claim is insufficient where none of those allegedly conspiring defendants are alleged to have violated a substantive provision of RICO. So it really was YouTube videos, and Corey thought they were all involved in a grand conspiracy. No, they were, they were all providing valid criticism of you, Corey, that uh, criticism does not a lawsuit make. The plaintiff's RICO conspiracy claim against Mr. Widener must be dismissed. That's his uh, 0 for 2. Claim 3, the federal trademark infringement. The plaintiffs assert that the defendants committed federal trademark infringement in violation of the uh, list of statutes here. The Lanham Act protects both trademarks and service marks. A trademark is any word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof used by a person which person has a bona fide intention to use in commerce and applies to register on the principal register established by this chapter to identify and distinguish his or her goods, including a unique product from those manufactured or sold by others, and to indicate the source of the good, even if that source is unknown. A service mark is the same, except that it is used to identify and distinguish the services of one person, including a unique service from the services of others, and to indicate the source of the services, even if the source is unknown. Jesus, I feel like I'm reading some sort of tongue twister. 
titles, character names, and other distinctive features of radio or television programs may be registered as service marks, notwithstanding that they or the programs may advertise the goods of the sponsor. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I, should, I should change the name of the podcast, Cosmic Disclosure, just for fun. Uh, list some more of the sections here. This Landham Act protects the owner of a registered mark from any person who shall, without consent, use any reproduction, counterfeit copy, or colorable imitation of a registered mark in connection with the sale, offering for sale, distribution, or advertising of any goods or services when such use is likely to cause confusion or to cause mistake or to deceive. Uh, list a bunch of acts again. Uh, the federal unfair competition law provides, as is relevant here, that a person who uses in commerce any word, term, name, symbol, or device that is likely to cause confusion or to cause mistake or to deceive as to the affiliation, connection, and association of such person with another person shall be liable in civil action. Uh, the Act protects registered marks, and this other section protects unregistered marks. I'm not quite sure what he's claiming they stole. I mean, I know they continued to use Cosmic Disclosure when he left because they had uh, Jason Rice, who I believe Corey also sued at some point or at the very least threatened. I'm going to laugh my ass off as Corey is trying to claim that they used, that, that they were violating his uh, trademark by making YouTube videos talking about it. It, it maybe I'm misremembering, but I don't even remember their videos being monetized at the time. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how you'd prove damages if someone didn't profit off of it. The elements of an infringement claim under the sections that the plaintiff has a protectable interest in the mark that the defendant has used an identical or similar mark in commerce, and that the defendant's use is likely to confuse consumers. An infringement claim under Section 32 has nearly identical elements except that the registration of mark serves as prima facie evidence of both the mark's validity and the registrant's exclusive right to use it in commerce. No, good, the video's still going. All right, at least I'll get 30-some minutes out of it. The plaintiffs rely on the same allegations in support of their claim. Uh, Claim 3, Federal Trademark Infringement. Claim 4, False Designation of Origin and Federal Unfair Competition. Well, anyone competing with Corey is unfair. The man's an idiot. Claim 5, Colorado Common Law Trademark and Trade Name Infringement. And Claim 6, Colorado Common Law Unfair Competition. The, those allegations are as follows. Ooh, here we go. As early as 2008, Mr. Good began speaking at various events... That's not true, is it? 2008? Didn't he not get doxxed by Kerry Cassidy until like 2013? So how would he be speaking at events without anyone knowing who he is or what his story is? As early as 2008, Mr. Good began speaking at various events and recounting his personal experiences tied to a secret space program, which he termed the 20 and back missions. There is the little, uh, the little trademark thing next to 20 and back in the document. As a result of Mr. Good publicly sharing his story and experiences, the Sphere Being Alliance, SBA, branding and message and its progeny were developed by Mr. Good. Mr. Good also began sharing his stories and experiences involving angelic beings that he called the Blue Avians. Well, he didn't really call them uh, angelic beings until people started criticizing him for having th the ridiculous uh, Blue Avians in his story. Uh, in fact, I only really remember... Once people started making fun of the blue chickens, shout out to uh, Cliff High for coining that phrase, that is kind of when he started to pivot away from it because he started to realize it was very easy to make fun of him for saying he was talking to giant chickens. It's still very easy to make fun of him. I intend to keep doing it. During the three years that Mr. Good was working on Cosmic Disclosure, God, this is all, it really, it all occurred over the course of three years. So at this point, Corey, real ha he really has been trying to cause damage to people's lives, in my opinion, for longer than he was theoretically trying to help them with cosmic disclosure. These lawsuits have been going on for, I think, about three years, if not a little over. And he was only on cosmic disclosure for three years. That's not, uh, that's not quite the balance you'd want to strike between good and evil. 
The content he generated included his personal story and subject matters that he had been sharing and developing prior to his involvement with Gaia, including but not limited to the Blue Avians, 20 and Back, and SBA branding and message. Mr. Good has, had worked autonomously on print, clothing, and media goods and services tied to his arbitrary protected phrases, Blue Avians, 20 and Back, Sphere Bang Alliance, SBA, The Good Marks. This work was done well in advance and separate and apart from his work with and for Gaia. I don't recall that either. In fact, I really only remember him coming to prominence as a result of Gaia. Uh, the good marks have become a source indicator of goods, goodwill, branding, and message, and have, as such, acquired secondary meaning. Well, I would, I, I agree with the assessment that uh, Corey Good and his statements have acquired a secondary meaning. I disagree strongly with the idea that those have a positive connotation. I think those are. Uh, Crit like they're they're poisonous at this point. Anyone who were to implement those in a sincere way would probably not be viewed favorably by the general cosmic public. The GES marks, uh, oh, good enterprise solutions marks, have become through widespread and favorable industry acceptance and recognition an asset of substantial value. <laughs> not anymore. Symbolizing good enterprise solutions, its quality products. And services and it's good well okay well right off the bat big problem there remember the documentary he did where they just like forgot to plug the microphone in i wouldn't i wouldn't call doing a movie where a microphone doesn't work i wouldn't call that a quality product there's only two things you need for a movie and that's video and audio and he horrifically fucked up one of those elements maybe he just has a different bar for quality from the rest of us Maybe he grades on a scale where uh, failing 50% of a task counts as, as passing. The marks have become, right, substantive and all this, uh, quality products. Consumers of paper, clothing, and educational and entertainment goods and services in the conscious community recognize the GES marks as a source indicator for good. Good Enterprise Solutions has registered marks in SBA and Sphere Being Alliance. Good Enterprise Solutions has common law marks in 20 and Back and Blue Avians. Gaia, including through Rysavi, Warkins, and Medovich, violated the trademark application for 20 and Back by continuing to use goods protected phrase on various advertising and promotional materials. Yeah, but he talked about it on a show on their network. I'm pretty sure that would kind of, in part at least, make it their property right like i don't uh i don't know what film studio put out the hobbit or whatever but if that film studio wanted to talk about the people and characters contained within the hobbit i don't think that violates a trademark they're they're the ones who own the property just prior to mr good's departure from gaia uh, and Cosmic Disclosure, Guy hired additional talent to take over Mr. Good's role on the show. Individuals like Jason Rice, Emery Smith, and others appeared on Cosmic Disclosure and proceeded to use goods marks, protected phrases, and testimony. I did, so I was under the impression that, uh, not Jason Rice, what was the other name I just read? Emery Smith. I was under the impression that he had not been involved in this community in a very long time. And I'm glad to find out I, uh, I am wrong on that front. Someone the other day sent me a video of his uh, Facebook page where, well, first of all, he's selling products that are supposed to be medical cures, including, I believe, a cure for cancer. Uh, he was selling a half gallon of water for 600 bucks on his website. But way more importantly than that, he put up a cooking video where he was supposedly making a stew. Now, I can't accuse a man of being shit-faced drunk because I can't necessarily be sure. I can, however, say I'm usually quite good at discerning whether or not an individual is shit-faced drunk. And one of the things I use uh, to, to implement my power of discernment is when I see a man filming a cooking video and he's kind of slurring his words, and then he goes to cut a piece of ginger with a knife and he entirely misses the piece of ginger on his cutting board that does not seem like the actions of a sober man. His uh, hand-eye coordination is severely lacking, if that is the case. And again, as a guy who I believe claimed did autopsies, your hand-eye coordination typically needs to pretty, be pretty good to dissect an individual and move their, their limbs and veins aside without uh, destroying them. 
It couldn't be possible that Emery was lying about all that, could it? Could it, could it maybe be the case that Emery was full of shit, too? I'll leave that to the public to decide. Anyways, cosmic disclosure. They proceeded to use goods, marks, protected phrases, and testimony. In March 2018, Ms. Medovich moved forward with shooting scenes for cosmic disclosure. Without Every time I see the phrase shooting, I expect this to get much more interesting, but it's always the just shooting scenes. For cosmic disclosure, without Mr. Good knowing Gaia was intending to use Good's branding, marks, and message through another guest on cosmic disclosure. Gaia defrauded consumers by continuing to use Mr. Good's content and claimed marks after Mr. Good left the show and after it received cease and desist letters from Good Enterprise Solutions. Widener and Gaia consistently tag Mr. Good and use the Good marks in their social media posts. They make repeated misuse of the Good marks through the use of tagging. You gotta be fucking kidding me. He's suing because they, they tagged him on social media? Corey really is a fucking baby. Just a dumb, dumb baby. Every time I think we have found the bottom limit of him being a dumb piece of shit, he continues to surpass it. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Every, every time you think he's capped out the stupidity meter, he shatters, <laughs> he shatters that glass ceiling. He finds a way to break new ground. Mr. Widener's YouTube channel includes a video titled Corey Good and the Fear Being Alliance. Again, you gotta be shitting me. Which utilizes the YouTube algorithm to link Widener's channel to goods. My word, he used the YouTube algorithm to benefit himself? Throw him under the prison. I, who the fuck was his lawyer? Is this like a Lionel Hutz type character? Was she paid in popsicles? I, this is the part that always puzzles me. One adult doing something really fucking stupid, I get, but when a group of adults gets together to act like idiots, I'm just puzzled that no, they don't have one friend who's not retarded. They don't have one person who is, uh, you know, somewhere in the 80 to 90 IQ region. I don't even need to hit, uh, they don't even need to hit 100. Just someone maybe within one or two standard deviations below the average would have been able to look at this and say, hey, this seems kind of like a very flimsy allegation that he said fear being alliance and you own the trademark on sphere being alliance. Anyways. This utilizes the YouTube algorithm to link Widener's channels to good by using the Sphere Being Alliance mark in the summary description of the video. Defendants uh, made use of GES marks by asking its talent not asking its talent not oh not including Mr. Good sorry the the sentence is kind of broken apart Mr. Good by appearing on Guy TV in a role akin to Mr. Goods to use the GS marks in their commentary and dialogue in Gaia produced and or Gaia related content thereby causing the GS marks to display prominently and in association with Gaia and other defendant related names these activities were carried out without Good Enterprise Solutions or Mr. Goods consent Defendants and or defendants agents affiliates sent, uh, sent existing and prospective good customers numerous emails and social media messages and marketing which promoted their own products or services under the GES marks or represented that their products or services were offered under GES marks when in fact they are not. These allegations, while detailed, <laughs> we're back to the judge speaking. These allegations, while detailed, do not state a claim for federal trademark infringement. I'm sorry to notice a pattern here. It's almost as if Corey and his team had literally no idea. It's almost as if they're completely incompetent. Hard to believe. Although the complaint identifies four trademarks, it fails to sufficiently allege which mark or marks were used by a specific defendant. Uh, when that mark or marks were used, and in what context. Well, yeah, but who needs context? He knows it feels wrong, and feelings are way more important than evidence. His tears say more than evidence ever could. The facts alleged do not support a reasonable inference that any particular defendant used one of the marks in commerce or in any way that was likely to confuse consumers. A plausible claim must allege sufficient uh, facts for the defendants and the court to identify the market issue in at least some instances of misuse. 
In order to survive a motion to dismiss, a plaintiff must plead facts sufficient to state a plausible claim that defendant used plaintiff's marks in connection with any goods or services. The plaintiff alleges that Gaia and Gaia individuals used goods protected phrases on various advertising and promotional materials and used the marks in Mr. Good's testimony or message on cosmic disclosure, and that Gaia tagged Mr. Good and used the good marks in social media posts, but the complaint does not provide any specific... <laughs> He's so fucking dumb. It doesn't provide any specific examples of these alleged uses or facts regarding the how the marks were used on promotional materials on the show or in social media posts that would support a reasonable inference of use in commerce or consumer confusion. Simply mentioning Mr. Good or his marks in those contexts is not enough. This guy really thought he was just going to go to court and the judge would just take his side. Now, one of the reasons Corey thought the judge was going to take his side many moons ago, he posted, he was very glad that he had a Trump appointed judge. And I think he assumed that he was going to win against uh, whatever the woke agenda <laughs> because the, the Trump, the Trump appointed judge would side with him. But it turns out judges still need to see evidence no matter what their political leanings are. As to Mr. Widener, the only allegations are of general tagging on social media on one specific instance where he used Fear Being Alliance in the written description of one of his YouTube videos. As noted, general allegations of social media tagging are insufficient. As to YouTube, the video in question was titled Corey Good and the, and the Fear Being Alliance. In other words, it was a video critical of Mr. Good. This cannot support a reasonable inference that consumers might be confused as to the source of the video or whether Mr. Good was associated or affiliated with the video or its content. Uh, cites the, the case law here. Cites it a lot. Uh, let me see. To protect the ability of consumers to distinguish among competing producers, not to prevent all unauthorized uses or to quash an unauthorized use of the mark by another, who is communicating ideas or expressing points of view, such as websites offering critical commentary about the trademark owner. Uh, the requirement of trademark law is that a likely confusion of source, sponsorship, or affiliation must be proven, which is not the same thing as a right not to be made fun of. Well, isn't that great news for me? I can make fun of them all I like, and I have. I'm hoping to, to fight my way into a spot in Corey Good's hater documentary. If I do an interview with him, at least I can remind him to use a microphone that works. It's going to be ironic when I put this up and the audio quality is terrible. I was getting like a, a bunch of scratching sounds when I was trying to set this up earlier. So I suppose it'd be only fitting for me to speak down to him and then have the exact same issue occur in my video. But that's okay because uh, I don't know why it's okay. It's okay when I do it because I'm much better than he is in more ways than one. I've lost my place in the document. The plaintiffs have failed to adequately allege facts to support the second or third elements of a trademark infringement claim as to Gaia and Gaia individuals or Mr. Widener, and this claim must therefore be dismissed as to those defendants. Oh, sorry, I didn't give that the proper gravitas. That was uh, claim three being dismissed. So, so far we got Corey is 0 for 3. That's okay. You know, there haven't been a lot of people who came back from a 3-0 deficit in uh, in sports, but maybe maybe Corey, maybe he'll pull this one off. We'll get a comeback victory here. Claim four, false designation of origin and unfair competition. This is uh, for Gaia, the Gaia individuals, and Mr. Widener. The plaintiffs assert that the defendants committed false designation of origin and federal unfair competition. As noted above, uh, this is also known as Section 43A of the Lanham Act or the Federal Unfair Competition Law. This provision is also known as the False Designation Provision and provides a broader remedy for unfair competition through misleading advertising or labeling that goes beyond trademark protection. This section provides... Any person who, on or in connection with any goods or services or any container for goods, uses in commerce any word, term, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof, or any false designation of origin, false or misleading description of fact, or false or misleading representation of fact, which is likely to cause confusion or to cause mistake or to deceive as to the affiliation, connection, association of such person with another person, 
or is to the origin, sponsorship, or approval of his or her goods, services, or commercial activities by another person. I'm sorry, I have to keep moving away from the microphone to breathe in like Tazon Day. In commercial advertising or promotion, misrepresents... Uh, Sorry, in commercial advertising or promotion, misrepresents the nature, characteristics, qualities, or geographic origin of his or her or another person's goods, services, or commercial activities. I don't know how people become lawyers. I would go insane if I had to read this for, for more than the hour and some change I'm going to spend doing it. The Supreme Court has referred to claims falling under subsection A as false association or false designation claims and claims falling under subsection B as false advertising claims. A false designation of origin claim may take one of two forms, uh, passing off where a party represents his or her own goods or services as someone else's or reverse passing off where a party misre misrepresents someone else's goods or services as his or her own. Uh, the plaintiffs here appear to be asserting a passing off claim. The defendants made repeated representations about the source, origin, and nature of defendants' products that have created the false and misleading impression that defendants' goods or services are manufactured by Good Enterprise Solutions or affiliated, endorsed, controlled, or approved by Good Enterprise Solutions. In fact, they are not. Federal rule of civil procedure requires a party to state with particularity the circumstances con constituting fraud or mistake. As noted above, this means that a plaintiff must set forth the time, place, and contents of the false representation, the identity of the party making the false statements, and the consequences thereof. Notice how all those things were lacking in the accusation portion we just read. To demonstrate falsity within the meaning of the Lanham Act, a plaintiff may show that the statement was literally false, either on its face or by necessary implication, or that the statement was literally true but likely to mislead or confuse consumers. This applies to claims of falsity under the Lanham Act insofar as the factual averments allege intentional or knowing misrepresentations. Here, the plaintiffs allege that the defendant's conduct was knowing, willful, and continuing in nature. The uh, requirements of Rule 9b therefore apply, and plaintiffs must plead their allegations of falsity with particularity uh, to the extent of the Lanham Act claim is based entirely on a unified course of fraudulent conduct. The entire claim must be pled with particularity. As noted above, the plaintiffs rely on the same allegations to support both their trademark infringement and false designation claims. Oh, that's, they're really, they're just so lazy. I'm not sure if they even believe this or if they just figured if they threw out enough charges, one of them was bound to stick. I mean, there's, whatever, 13 charges in this. I don't know if any of them land. I, I, I haven't read through the entire document. I was saving it for this. Those allegations, which will not be repeated here, do not provide the requisite time, place, and contents of any false representation. Well, again, details, details. Who needs the specifics? The plaintiff's allegations are conclusory and do not connect any specific defendant to any specific instance of passing off. The complaint does not explain how the defendant's use, uh, use of Mr. Good's name or one of the trademark phrases on cosmic disclosure and promotional materials or in hashtags on social media or Mr. Widener's use of Sphere Bang Alliance in the written description of a YouTube video critical of Mr. Good falsely designated the origin of any goods or services in a manner that was likely to confuse or deceive consumers. Well, yeah, uh, the, the reason why it doesn't seem that way is because none of them were doing that. The plaintiffs have therefore failed to state a claim for false designation of origin or unfair competition. The claims must be dismissed as to Gaia, Gaia individuals, Mr. Widener. All right, Corey's 0 for 4. I'm confident, though. I feel he's going he's gonna to bound to come back any minute now. Claim 5. Common law trademark and trade name infringement. The plaintiffs assert that, that the defendants committed trademark and trade name infringement under Colorado common law. The plaintiffs allege that defendants' unauthorized use of GES marks and names for or in connection with the same or similar products and services infringes upon goods, common law trademark, and trade name rights. The elements of common law trademark or service mark infringement are similar to those required to prove, uh, uh, to prove unfair competition. Among other things, a plaintiff must establish a protectable interest in its mark, the defendant's use of that mark in commerce, and the likelihood of consumer confusion. Well, it sure seems like that's probably not going to go well for Corey. 
The plaintiff's common law trademark infringement claim fails for the same reasons as the their federal claims and must therefore be dismissed as to Gaia Guy individuals and Mr. Widener. All right, 0 for 5. It's looking bad at this point. He'd only be able to lose one more of these and come out on top for the rest to win the series if we were to look at this in a sporting context. Claim 6. Common law unfair competition. The plaintiffs assert that defendants committed unfair competition under Colorado common law. They allege that defendants have made unauthorized and infringing use of goods, trademarks, and trade names wrongfully and illegally took control of goods content, causing goods information and favorable social media content to be associated with the defendants. All right, he doesn't have favorable social media content. The dude's got 75,000 followers and he gets four likes on a tweet. Uh, the content causing goods information and favorable social media content to be associated with the defendants, clearly intending to benefit from the reputation and goodwill residing in goods, utilized Gaia position as a content provider and director of Cosmic Disclosure to gain access to goods existing and prospective customers with the intent of and undertaking action and deceptive communications to create confusion and misperception and thereby diverting their business to Gaia. Defendants have sought to pass off their goods as those of defendants by virtue of use of goods trademark and trade names leading to actual confusion on the part of the consumer. Well, again, I don't, I don't think he's provided any evidence that this confusion has occurred. I certainly, uh, I was never confused as to whether or not Jay Widener was acting on behalf of Good Enterprise Solutions. He, if, if he was, he would have been a terrible representative for the brand. It's typically really poor to represent your company by talking about how stupid it is. <laughs> that's, that's not, it's not the best uh, advertising tactic. Under Colorado common law, the tort of unfair competition protects against copying of non-functional aspects of consumer products which have acquired secondary meaning such that they operate as a designation of source. A claim of unfair competition regarding a similar trade name requires a plaintiff to adequately allege its name has acquired a secondary meaning and the defendant has unfairly used the names or a simulation of it against the plaintiff. The use of the same or a similar name can constitute unfair competition if the public is likely to be, be deceived by its use. The Colorado Supreme Court has held that with respect to trademarks or trade names, the purpose of an unfair competition claim is to protect the owner of a trademark or name in the public at large from unfair competition, confusion in the public's mind, and false or misleading claims. As noted, well, this doesn't look good for Corey. As noted, the plaintiffs rely on the same factual allegations to support both their federal and common law claims for trademark infringement and unfair competition. Uh, competition. Just reading about Corey has made me illiterate. I can't speak anymore. For the same reasons discussed above, the plaintiff's complaint does not adequately allege that the defendants have used Mr. Good's name or the plaintiff's trademarks in any way that is likely to deceive consumers. The plaintiff's common law unfair competition claim must therefore, say it with me everybody, be dismissed as to Gaia Gaia individuals, Mr. Widener. All right, sure, he's 0 for 6. But any, any claim now, he's going to start mounting his comeback. I would have given a very large quantity of money to be able to watch Corey have to read this, or I guess more accurately have someone read it to him. I'm not entirely sure he's literate. Claim 7. Colorado Consumer Protection Act. The plaintiffs assert that the defendants have violated the Colorado Consumer Protection Act. Defendants sought to pass off defendants' products and or services as being good products or otherwise affiliated with controlled or approved by GES. I, I really wish he would state what the products are, because I, I literally I have no idea what he's talking about. It can't it can't just be YouTube videos. He couldn't possibly have been that dumb. I sort of get the claim against Gaia. I think it's bullshit too, but I kinda get it. But all this other stuff just has quite literally no grounding in reality. Anyways, Corey says, I'm sorry not to, you know, not to add my own side in here. Editorialize is the word I was looking for. Made false representations attributing to the source, sponsorship, approval, or certification of defendant's goods 
and or services to GES and made false representations that defendants and defendants' goods and or services are affiliated, connected, associated with, or certified by good. A defendant engages in unfair deceptive trade practices under this by either knowingly or recklessly passing off goods, services, or property as that of another, either knowingly or recklessly making a false representation as to the source, sponsorship, approval, or certification of goods, services, or property, either knowingly or recklessly making a false claim representation as to affiliation, connection, or association with the cert uh, certification of another. The elements of a private cause of action under the act are as follows. The defendant is engaged in unfair, deceptive trade practice. The challenge practice occurred in the course of defendant's business, vocation, or occupation. It significantly impacts the public as actual or potential consumers of the defendant's goods, services, or property. The plaintiff suffered the injury, in fact, to a legally protected interest, and the challenge practices caused the plaintiff's injury. I don't think you can prove any of that either. Claims under the act must be pleaded with particularity pursuant to this. It seems to be the particularity that Corey struggled with here. Because I haven't actually really heard a specific claim, and we're 22 pages into this 36-page document. The defendants argue that they have adequately pleaded this claim because they are stupid. No, I'm sorry. Uh, because they allege that Gaia defrauded consumers by continuing to use goods content, and Gaia also used bribery, witness tampering, and counterfeiting to profit off of goods name. <laughs> they <laughs> no, they didn't. Witness tampering. They also argue that their allegations that defendant made multiple representations to at least the owner of various conferences that caused the owner of these conferences to cancel goods appearance at those conferences support this claim. Well, I know what he's talking about there. I believe Jay Widener uh, spoke to someone. But it, again, it's not illegal. If I was a huge asshole to someone and that person happened to be friends with someone who, who ran a conference, and that individual told the conference runner about what a what an asshole I am and how difficult I am to work with. And that guy decided to cancel me from the conference. That's not illegal. It's not illegal to not want to work with an asshole. Corey really just thinks anytime something doesn't go his way, it's illegal. It's illegal for Corey to not be successful. They also argue that their allegation that defendants made multiple representations to at least the owners of various conferences that caused the owner of these conferences to cancel goods appearance at those conferences supports this claim. But the complaint does not provide the requisite time, place, and contents of the false representation under, <laughs> underlying the alleged affair or deceptive trade practices. The complaint does not meet the particularity requirements. The plaintiff's Colorado Consumer Protection Act claim must therefore be, again, everybody say it with me, dismissed as to Gaia and the Gaia individuals, Mr. Widener. All right, well, he officially can't win the majority anymore. He's now over seven on 13 claims. Now you're just, you're playing, uh, you're playing for the love of the game and uh, personal pride, however much of that Corey has left. Claim eight breach of contract. The plaintiffs assert that defendants breach Mr. Code's contracts with Gaia. The elements of breach of contract are a valid contract existed. The plaintiff performed its obligations under the agreement. The defendant did not perform its obligations under the agreement. And the plaintiff was damaged by the defendant's breach. The plaintiff's breach of contact allegations are as follows. While negotiating his talent contract, as well as any amendments thereto and subsequent verbal agreements, Mr. Good met with Gaia CEO Rice Safi and or employees and agents of Gaia, Warkins, Widener, and Medovich. On August 22, 2016, Mr. Good, uh, oh, sorry, Gaia entered into a talent agreement with Mr. Good, promising certain compensation for his work on cosmic disclosure, as well as various speaking arrangements. That contract is in the record. The parties executed, <laughs> well, there's someone I wish they would have executed. The parties executed an amendment to the 2016 contract on or about August 29th, 2017. They don't know what day a contract was signed. Isn't that like one of the most fundamental things on important documents? I don't think I've ever signed legal documents without also dating it. Well, what's the importance of time when you can uh, pause time for 20 years at a go? Corey is 200 years old, and I suppose back in those days, 
contracts were a bit different. Mr. Good's additional compensation for his work on Cosmic Disclosure, the 2017 amendment, that amendment is in the record. Subsequently, Guy entered into a verbal agreement with plaintiff promising to issue him stock options in exchange for Mr. Good's agreement to continue working on Cosmic Disclosure. Under the August 2016 talent agreement and the August 2017, uh, 2017 amendment, the subsequent verbal agreement, Gaia, through Raisavi, promised Mr. Good various forms of compensation in exchange for his appearance on Cosmic Disclosure, including inter alia talent fees or a performance bonus and monthly reports on the revenue brought in by uh, CD, Cosmic Disclosure, used to calculate any such performance bonuses. Fees under the Ambassador Program, licensing royalties, and $150,000 in stock options. Mr. Good agreed to work with Gaia in exchange for those promises and additional monetary amounts agreed by, to by the parties. Mr. Good fulfilled his contractual obligations. Gaia, through Raisavi, breached the contract agreement by failing to pay the promised performance bonus and or the fees owed under the ambassador program in full. Further, no qualified viewing time data, which is used to calculate the performance bonuses, was provided to Mr. Good. That's really common for those of you who don't know. Like if you if you have a, a podcast signed under Spotify, they will not give you the data for your show. Same with Netflix, I believe. It's because knowing the data would give a uh, very big upper hand to the talent. And, of course, they don't want that to occur. Since Mr. Good was not given the access to the monthly revenue reports, he was unable to calculate financial losses for the bonus. Gaia, through Raisavi, wholly failed to pay the licensing royalties owed to Mr. Good under the section of the contract, which was not modified by the 2017 amendment. Gaia licensed CD to Amazon for syndication. Is Cosmic Disclosure really on Amazon? I have to do some watch-alongs. Uh, Mr. Good was entitled to a royalty payment of 20% of the television syndication licenses paid to Gaia by third parties, less expenses paid by Gaia directly related to the license. To date, Gaia has failed to pay Mr. Good the promised royalty payments. Now, I believe part of this, and I'm, I'm speaking from memory, but I believe Corey had actually been fronted a sizable amount of money by Gaia in order to help him move, and I believe he also just needed some money. So I think they fronted him a certain amount of money with the expectation that it would be fulfilled in the form of him performing other duties later on. I noticed that portion has been left out of all this. Maybe I'm misremembering. Gaia has failed and refused to issue, issue Mr. Good the 150000 in stock options that he was promised. Based on information and belief, Gaia, through Medovich, Warkins, and Raisavi, verbally agreed to issue 150000 in stock options to Mr. Good prior to the execution of the 2017 amendment and subsequently ratified that agreement by promising to issue the stock options to Mr. Good in 2018 if Mr. Good agreed to participate in the filming of additional Cosmic Disclosure episodes through June 2018. Mr. Good accepted the offer and fulfilled his obligations to stay on the show through June 2018. However, Mr. Good was never issued the stock options. Gaia through Raisavi breached the agreements, causing financial loss to Mr. Good in the form of unpaid performance bonuses, ambassador program fees, royalty payments, and unissued stock options. Man, he's really uh, banging on about those stock options. On information and belief, Widener's job description included compliance with company policies and procedures as to goods, the, uh, the Gaia individuals, and Gaia. And Widener and Gaia breached the contract by failing to adhere to company policies, including but not limited to those concerning the confidentiality of Good Enterprise Solutions, confidential and proprietary, informa <laughs> proprietary information. I've never heard of lies called proprietary information. Usually that's reserved for something like the uh, Colonel's 11 herbs and spices, not the Colonel's 11 lies and fabrications. Widener, the guy individuals, and Gaia further breached their contract with Good by acting in a manner contrary to the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing. Gaia. As noted above, the plaintiffs allege that Guy failed to pay Mr. Good the following compensation owed under the contracts, the performance bonus, fee do fees owed under the ambassador program, royalties from a license to Amazon. I should mention we're back to the judge talking here, I believe. The, those were all Corey's allegations. Uh, they also failed to pay the uh, 150000 stock options promised orally. Gaia argues that the plaintiff's breach of contract claim fails because the plaintiff's allegations regarding the performance bonus and ambassador program are conclusory because the complaint does not allege any facts. Again, who needs these facts? 
any facts regarding for what period of time payment was not made, <laughs> or even an approximation of the damages suffered. He doesn't know how much money he's owed. He just knows he needs money. <laughs> he might be the dumbest man alive. That's quite a title to achieve. He just, he threw a four-year tantrum. And now we get to all enjoy laughing at him. Everyone point and laugh at Mr. Good because he has earned it. All right, so sure he doesn't have facts and he doesn't even have an approximation of damages, but I'm sure this is going to go his way. Uh, the complaint alleges that Gaia failed to pay a performance bonus and or ambassador program fees, suggesting that plaintiffs are merely guessing as to whether there was a breach at all <laughs> of either category. Okay, uh, so yeah, the judge thankfully called that out, which is this this claim kind of seems like a lot of bullshit. He's just throwing a bunch of things out, hoping something sticks. But even in that, he doesn't have any specifics. So what what damages would they even be paying? You can't just say, you owe me money, and then they, I guess, just throw money at you. Maybe it's like Grand Theft Auto, where you knock someone out and bales of money just appear on the ground. As to the Amazon royalties, plaintiffs have not alleged conditions precedent, namely that there were any license payments due after expenses. And as to the stock options, any alleged oral promises are bared in light of a merger clause in the August 2016 talent agreement. And in any case, the plaintiffs have failed to allege the essential terms of the oral agreement with sufficient definitiveness. As to the performance bonus, the plaintiffs have stated a plausible claim for relief. The complaint identifies the contracted issue, identifies what Mr. Good is allegedly entitled to under the contract, and alleges that he did not receive what he was promised under the contract. Um, the August 2016 talent agreement states that Mr. Good will be paid a talent fee and performance bonus for all programs produced under the terms of this agreement. The plaintiffs allege that Mr. Good performed his obligations as an on-air talent... I understand that's the technical f term, but uh, talent is not present anywhere in that man's body. And that Gaia did not pay the performance bonus in full. That is all that is required at this stage. As to the ambassador program fees, however, the plaintiffs have not pleaded enough facts to state a plausible claim. The August 2016 talent agreement provides that Mr. Good will have the opportunity to act as a Gaia ambassador and that Gaia will pay Mr. Good a commission for the new subscribers referred by Mr. Good calculated on all subscription fees actually received by Gaia from those new subscribers. Although the complaint alleges that Mr. Good performed all his obligations under the contracts, nowhere does it allege that Mr. Good referred any new subscribers to Gaia. The plaintiffs have not alleged facts sufficient to support a reasonable inference that Mr. Good is owed any commission under the ambassador program. As to the licensing royalties, the plaintiffs have stated a plausible claim for relief. A plausible is pretty good. The August 2016 talent agreement provides that if Gaia, in its discretion, licenses any of the AV works for television syndication to non-affiliated third parties, then Gaia will pay Mr. Good a royalty equal to 20% of licensing, licensing net receipts. The complaint alleges that Gaia licensed Cosmic Disclosure to Amazon for syndication, that Gaia failed to, uh, failed to pay the royalty owed. The condition precedent to a royalty is if Gaia licenses any of the AV works for television syndication to non-affiliated third parties. If that condition occurs, as the plaintiffs have alleged, then a royalty is owed. It appears to be in dispute whether the amount of licensing net receipts was greater than... <laughs> It appears to be a dispute whether the amount of licensing net receipts was greater than zero dollars. But I must view the facts alleged in light most favorable to the plaintiffs at the motion to dismiss stage. Discovery may reveal that the amount of royalty owed is zero dollars because there were no licensing net receipts after expense. But contrary to Guy's argument, the existence of licensing net receipts greater than zero is not a condition precedent that must be pleaded to a state of claim for relief. All right, so Corey's not doing too bad, I mean, compared to all the other uh, claims. So he seems to partially be getting through on this one. As to the stock options, the plaintiffs have not pleaded a plausible claim, well, so much for that, for relief because they failed to allege sufficient facts regarding the essential terms of the oral agreement. Uh, 
bunch of case. Uh, the plaintiffs allege that Gaia verbally agreed to issue 150,000 stock options to Mr. Good. Mr. Good agreed to participate in the filming of additional Cosmic Disclosure episodes through June of 2018, but they do not allege any further details regarding the oral contract, such as the option price, the time to execute, the class of stock, or the vesting date. In order for a contract to be enforced, the essential terms must be definite, certain, clear, and unambiguous. The plaintiffs have not pleaded facts sufficient to support a reasonable inference that an enforceable contract exists. Whoops. In sum, the plaintiffs have alleged a plausible claim for relief for the breach of performance bonus and licensing royalty provisions for written contracts. Round of applause for, for Corey Good, ladies and gentlemen. He has a plausible claim. They have failed to state a claim for breach of ambassador program provisions or for breach of an oral agreement for stock options. Guy Individuals and Mr. Widener. The plaintiff's breach of contract fails as against the Gaia Individuals and Mr. Widener because the plaintiffs have not alleged the existence of a contract between those individuals and Mr. Good. Again, who needs it? Just because he's claiming breach of contract and no contract existed, does that really mean he's wrong? The plaintiff's claims for breach of the written talent agreement and amendment and the oral contract for stock options concern contracts between Guy and Mr. Good. Nowhere does the complaint allege that Guy individuals or Mr. Widener were parties to these contracts. Similarly, the plaintiff's conclusory allegations that the Guy individual and Mr. Widener breached their employment contracts with Guy does not give rise to a breach of contract claim as between those individuals and Mr. Good. The plaintiffs argue that the guy individuals might be liable under a piercing the corporate veil theory, but the complaint pleads no facts that would support application of that theory. He, I, f I feel like Corey had chat GPT as a lawyer. Like he just, he, he had no idea what he was doing. The plaintiff's breach of contract claim must therefore altogether now be dismissed as to the guy individuals and Mr. Widener. All right. So he, he, he gets half a point on that one. So right now it's uh, a half a point to eight and a half, I believe. Claim nine, fraudulent misrepresentation. The, I can't believe my phone's still recording. Uh, the plaintiffs assert that guy and the guy individuals made fraudulent misrepresentations to Mr. Good in relation to his contract with Gaia. Specifically, they allege that on multiple occasions, Gaia and the Gaia individuals made misrepresentations regarding the employment contract between Good and Gaia that included compensation beyond what Gaia did, in fact, pay to Good. Gaia and the Gaia individuals induced Good to enter um, the employment contracts by relaying said misrepresentations to Good. Yeah, but he still had to read the contract before he signed it, right? The defendants argue that the plaintiff's fraudulent misrepresentation claims are barred by the economic loss rule. But the plaintiff's claims fail for another more straightforward reason. They have not pleaded them with particularity as required. To establish fraud, a plaintiff must show that the defendant made a false representation of a material fact, knowing that representation to be false, that the person to whom the representation was made was ignorant of the falsity, the, uh, that the representation was made with the intention that it be acted upon, and that the reliance resulted in damage to the plaintiff. Well, that... That uh, <laughs> doesn't read good to him. The plaintiff's complaint is completely deficient in this regard. He can't be doing well today. It It's not like the vast majority of these haven't even been remotely close. It's like it's sometimes at the, the halftime of an NBA game, they get someone who shoots the half-court shot to try and win. And every so often you get someone who just absolutely can't shoot a basketball and they end up throwing it and it hits the announcer's tail or some shit. That's what these claims are. He chucked a half-court shot and it fucking hits someone in the front row. I hope that person ends up suing him. Accordingly, the plaintiff's fraudulent misrepresentation claim must be dismissed. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hit it. Ah, oh, fuck, I ruined it. The claim must be dismissed as to Gaia and the Gaia individuals. Claim 13, slander per se. I feel like we skipped some claims. We went from 9 to 13 here. The plaintiffs assert that the defendants have committed slander per se as to Mr. Good. Slander is one of the two types of communication comprising the tort of defamation. 
damn, that makes uh, make fun of people sound so cool. The tort of defamation. That's another good potential name for the podcast. Slander is generally an oral communication. To establish an action for slander per se, the plaintiff must show the defendant made a verbal statement, the statement was published to a third party, and the statement defames the plaintiff's trade, business, or profession. Can you really defame the profession of claiming you lived on the moon with the dinosaurs? It's not exactly a noble profession to uh, participate in. The third element may also be met by imputation of a criminal offense, a loathsome disease, ooh, a matter incompatible with the individual's office or serious sexual misconduct. Didn't Corey accuse people of sexual misconduct, even though it was he who cheated on his wife? God damn, Corey's poor fucking kids. Can you imagine growing up with this guy as your father? Just a complete buffoon. Sorry, I just wanted to get in on the tort of defamation. Reading about all this slander made me want to say mean things. Here, the plaintiff's bla- uh, place. God damn it. God damn it. I'm losing it. We're so close to the end. I can't fall apart. Here, the plaintiffs base this claim on purported statements accusing Mr. Good of criminal acts. The allegations in the complaint regarding criminal acts are as follows. Widener has been on YouTube channels to accuse Good of criminal acts. Oh, the horror. Mr. Widener is part of an enterprise whose purpose is to accuse good of criminal activities through social media outlets and other wirings and use extortion, harassment, and any other manipulative tactic to deprive him of his livelihood. Defendants made a multitude of false spoken statements accusing good of a criminal act purporting to be facts. Well, if that's the case, I just want to be clear. I'm not purporting anything I say to be fact. I'm, I'm a liar on the scale of Corey. Everything I say is false. This is all for entertainment value. None of these statements provide enough detail to state a claim of slander per se. Shocking. The plaintiffs have not alleged, for example, what criminal activities Mr. Good has been accused of or described when these statements were made. Uh, <laughs> I believe he was accused of sodomy. Kidding, of course. He's not that cool. He, Mr. Good has been accused of or described when these statements were made. Um, the allegedly defamatory statements attributed defendants are either too vague to state a claim for defamation or, if accurately reported, are not defamatory as a matter of law. Here we go, everyone. Everyone's favorite part. Accordingly, the plaintiff's slander per se claim must be dismissed. As to Guy and Mr. Widener, if I could edit video, I'd put like, you know, fireworks or something going off, but jazz hands will have to suffice in lieu of video editing ability. Claim 14, libel per se. The plaintiffs assert that defendants have committed libel per se as to Mr. Good. Libel is the other of the two types of communication comp- uh, comprising the tort of defamation. Libel is usually a written communication, as with their slander per se claims. The plaintiffs base their libel per se claim on purported statements accusing Mr. Good of criminal acts. I wonder what those acts are. The only relevant allegations in the complaint are those discussed above in connection with the slander claims. Uh... Defendants made a multitude of false spoken statements and a multitude of false written statements. Okay, so he didn't provide any specifics. Again, shocking. Again, these statements do not provide enough detail to state a claim of libel per se because the complaint does not allege what criminal activities Mr. Good has been accused of or described when the statements were made. Did he just expect the the judge to go look all this shit up inside with him? Like, you have to produce the evidence, right? You can't just show up in court and hope someone else figures it all out. And it is unclear from the complaint whether or not the purported statements at issue were made in written form. <laughs> he couldn't. Even, this is how bad it was. He couldn't even for sure state that these libel claims were actually written down, as is required by a libel claim. Yes, it's very important. Accordingly, the plaintiff's libel per se claim must be Dismissed the word of the day as to Guy and Mr. Widener. Claim 15, tortuous inf- interference with a business expectancy. The plaintiffs assert that the defendants have committed tortuous in- interference. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that word wrong. I'm sorry. With a business expectancy. They allege that Good had a multitude of actual or prospective business contracts uh, 
with conferences and various entertainment agencies, and defendants knew of these actual or prospective business contracts and intentionally and improperly interfered with the performances of these contracts. Torturous interference with business expectancy is an intentional tort actionable under Colorado law, which is applicable where someone intentionally and improperly interferes with another's prospective contractual relation. The tort is applicable under two circumstances where one induces or causes a third person to not enter or continue the prospective relation or where one presents, oh, sorry, one prevents the other from acquiring or continuing the prospective relation. Because the tort is forward-looking, plaintiffs need not uh, prove the existence of an underlying contract to succeed on torturous interference. However, they must demonstrate that the tort, tort feaser, that's a great word too, employed intentional and improper means to prevent a contract's formation. The defendants argue that the plaintiff's allegations regarding whether the defendants used any wrongful means to interfere with the prospective businesses, contracts with ufology or conscious community conferences are too conclusory to state a plausible claim, and I agree. Uh, such as alleging Mr. Good was blacklisted from conferences due to defendants' influence. No, no, that was entirely of your own doing, Corey. People don't want to work with you because they don't like you, not because someone else made them do it. I also find that the plaintiffs have failed to allege facts sufficient to support a reasonable inf uh, in inference that there was a protected prospective contractual relationship or other business expectancy. The plaintiff's allegations do not show a reasonable probability that they would have received economic benefits from a third party in the absence of the defendant's actions. The plaintiff's claim for tortuous interference with a business expectancy must therefore be dismissed as to Gaia, the Gaia individuals, and Mr. Widener. Claim 17, uh, declaratory judgment, declaratory, declaratory judgment of trademark validity. Man, I'm glad I'm almost done. I'm really losing it here. The plaintiffs requested a declaratory judgment to determine the validity of the 20 and back and blue avian marks. Gaia argues that the court should exercise its discretion to decline jurisdiction over the plaintiff's declaratory judgment claim. The Declaratory Judgment Act is an enabling act which confers a discretion on the courts rather than an absolute right upon the litigant. In the declaratory judgment context, the normal principle that federal courts should adjudicate claims within their jurisdiction yields to consideration of practicality and wise judicial administration. If a district or a court in the sound exercise of its judgment determines after a complaint is filed that a declaratory judgment will serve no useful purpose, it cannot be incumbent upon the court to proceed uh, to the merits before staying or dismissing the action. The Tenth Circuit Court has identified five factors district courts should consider in determining whether to exercise their discretion to hear and decide claims for declaratory judgment. One, whether a declaratory action would settle this controversy. Two, whether it would serve a useful purpose in clarifying the legal relations at issue. Three, whether the declaratory remedy is being used merely for the purpose of procedural fencing or to provide an arena for a race to re judica, ju, judicata, gymcata. Whether, yeah, the, the legal kumite. They really got to use all these fucking words. They can't, they can't speak simple for a dummy like me. For whether use of declaratory action would increase friction between our federal and state courts and improperly encroach upon state jurisdiction. And five, whether there is an alternative remedy which is better or more effective. Consideration of these factors indicates that the court should decline declaratory judgment jurisdiction in this instance. I have dismissed the plaintiff's trademark infringement claims to the extent the parties have an ongoing dispute regarding ownership or validity of 20 and back and blue avian marks. Those issues can be resolved in the ongoing opposition proceedings before the trademark trial and appeal board. <laughs> Wait, there's another trademark trial going on? The plaintiffs appear to be using their declaratory judgment claim here as an attempt to bypass that proceeding. Okay, so Corey, yes, he was trying to use this to supersede the actual case that is going on. Uh, he says they're doing that, which is the more appropriate forum. Deciding the trademark validity issues in this forum where the trademark infringement claims have been dismissed would serve no useful purpose, and thus I find it unnecessary to devote judicial resources to the plaintiff's declaratory judgment claim. The... Da, 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 uh, 
TTAB proceedings, I don't know what that stands for, uh, are similar to a parallel state court proceeding, the presence of which weighs heavily toward declining jurisdiction. The plaintiff's declaratory judgment claims were therefore be dismissed, but without prejudice. So I believe that means he can refile this. Dismissal with prejudice. The plaintiffs have had three opportunities to attempt to state their claims through the filing of successive complaints in this matter. Uh, see, just list the documents. Whereas here, a plaintiff has repeatedly failed to cure deficiencies in its complaint. He has deficiencies that can't be cured. I'm uh, regretful to inform you. A court may refuse further amendments and dismiss the plaintiff's claim with prejudice. Cases are not to be litigated piecemeal, and a court does not have to address repeated improvements to the complaint. With the exception of the plaintiff's defamation claims against the guy individuals, which they have agreed to voluntarily dismiss, and their declaratory judgment claim, which is dismissed on jurisdictional grounds, their dismissed claims will all be dismissed with prejudice. Exactly the way I live my life, with prejudice. Conclusion. It is ordered that Gaia Inc.'s motion to dismiss is granted in part and denied in part. The plaintiff's declaratory judgment claim against Gaia is dismissed without prejudice, and the plaintiff's other claims against Gaia are dismissed with prejudice, with the exception of the breach of contract claim, to the extent it alleges breach of the performance bonus and licensing royalty provisions of the written contracts. Jay Widener's motion to dismiss is granted, and the plaintiff's claims against Ms. We uh, Mr. Widener are dismissed with prejudice. Uh, Raisavi Warkin's Medovich's motions to dismiss is granted. The plaintiff's slander per se and libel per se cl claims against uh, Raisavi Warkin's and Medovich are dismissed without prejudice, and the plaintiff's other claims against those defendants are dismissed with prejudice. Well, there you have it, folks. I know there's uh, several other lawsuits going on, but that was kind of the main one. And uh, I'm never going to miss an opportunity to point out to the public that Corey Good is a very dumb man who does very poorly in legal battles. He's, uh, he, he's in fact, never won any of these. So <laughs> I'm interested to see whether or not he's going to manage to make additional claims. I don't know how much money he's working with. I know in some sort of claim he, he was... Uh, stating that he didn't have funds to hire a lawyer. So we'll we'll see. Maybe he's lying in that case. I don't know. Uh, he does tend to have a habit of lying. Usually it's about space matters, though. I'm not sure how credible he is here on Earth. <laughs> this whole fucking thing is ridiculous. All right, guys, hootie hoop.